Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness, I thought I'd do something a bit different. I was looking at all the stories that have been sent to me by you, my listeners, and I have stories dating almost a full year back. So, I thought it'd be fun to have an entire episode of nothing but stories from weirdo family members. And if you've not already sent a story but you have a story to tell, you can send it to me by going to the Tell Your Story page at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Five Whistles by Wade Blair I was deer hunting in eastern Idaho in the fall of 2014. This was just before dusk, as I was heading out of the hills while there was still some light. I was watching a large bull moose cross a pocket of aspen trees. I saw what appeared to be a large eyeball in the patch of trees. I assumed it was the moose that I was watching. However, the moose had walked out of the patch of trees. I whistled at the moose, trying to get him to stop so I could get a picture of him with my phone through my spotting scope. Seconds later, something whistled at me five times. As a note, there have been Bigfoot sightings in this area for many years. Ghost in My House by Jason L. It's been going on for a few months now. My wife and kids would say, have you noticed anything weird going on? I said, no, why? My wife said, I've been seeing things out of the corner of my eye and hearing noises coming from the storage room. Of course, me being me, I said, it's just your imagination. A few days passed. My youngest son came to me and said, Dad, something scratched me. So then I thought maybe I need to go check out the storage room. So I did. And nothing. But I thought, to make my son feel better, I'd say, hey, whoever's here, you need to leave and stop bothering my family. I said, there, son, nothing will bother you again. But me, on the other hand, was a different story. That night, I got out of bed to use the bathroom, and as I was walking down the hall, I got hit in the chest. felt like somebody hit me with a sledgehammer. I told my wife, you were right, something bad is here. So, we've done some research on the last people that lived here and found out they had played with a Ouija board in what is now our storage room. So, we went to one of the churches close to our house and asked the preacher there if he'd come and do a blessing on our house. He agreed to come over and do the blessing. Whatever was here is not left yet, but it does seem to stay in the storage room, and it doesn't bother us. But, of course, we don't go into that room. The Right by Mike Brascone Having reached my elder years, I'll now tell you a story of my youth, and you'll not believe my story. No, not at first. If it hadn't happened to me, I would not believe it myself. When I was a boy, I learned of a rite that had been practiced by the males in my family for generations. I do not know how far into history it goes, My father told me that it was our way of marking a boy becoming a man. Of course, as I said, I was young and I did not understand. On the day before it was to be my turn, my father told me that my brother and cousin would be attending. They were older and had already gone through it. I asked them to tell me what was going to happen so that I could prepare myself, but they wouldn't tell me anything no one ever talked about what really happened during the rite anyway. 
it was a family secret. Like I said, no one told me what to expect, but a couple of years before that, I overheard two of my older cousins talking about it. I didn't hear very much because I only caught part of their conversation, but I did manage to hear that it included the killing of an animal. I was so horror-struck that I let out a yelp. Of course, they heard me and scolded me for spying. I wondered if they didn't know I was there all along and had made the story up, just to scare me. I couldn't imagine what kind of people would kill an animal for something like that anyway. The night before the right was torture. I didn't get a wink of sleep the whole night. I just laid there in bed, wondering what was going to happen the next day and what it would be like. I wondered if my cousins had been telling the truth about what was going to happen. Tears welled up in my eyes at the thought of it. I also kept trying to think of excuses to get out of it. I thought about telling my father that I was sick, but that wouldn't help. It'd only delay it for a couple of days at best. I wondered if he'd really make me do it if I told him I thought it was wrong. Would he think I was weak? What would my brother and cousin think of me? Would, would they still accept me as part of the family? The day started early. My father woke us up two hours before sunrise. I was already awake. I was in bed pretending to be asleep. He told me it was time to get up and get ready to go. I sat up, only now that I was being torn from my bed did I feel like I could sleep, if I could just lay back down. A thousand excuses and plans of escape crossed my mind as I got dressed. None of them seemed likely to work, though. When I emerged from my room, I saw that my brother and cousin were already up and were sitting with my father in the den. I expected to see the same look of dread on their faces that I had on my own, but if anything, they seemed excited. I thought that maybe the right wasn't as bad as I thought. They had both lived through it after all, and they seemed like the same people they'd always been. My spirits lifted a little. My father gave each of us boxes of equipment to carry, and we stepped through the door. As we walked into the woods, I kept thinking of what might be in the box I was carrying. But just inside of it was the answer to all of my questions. If I could just have seen what was in there, I would have known whether or not all of my worrying was in vain. Our path through the woods led us by the side of a creek. I wondered if the creek had anything to do with the right. Would killing the animal include drowning it? Maybe there was no animal at all. Maybe that was just a cruel lie my cousins cooked up to torture me. My answer was near. The path ended in a clearing along the bank of the creek. When we got there, my father, cousin, and brother set down their boxes. I followed their example and put mine down next to theirs. I stood there, looking down at the boxes for a few seconds, and then I backed away, never taking my eyes off of them. I kept watching them as if I'd expected a snake to jump out. As the time drew nearer, the agony got worse. The knots in my stomach were so tight that it was starting to hurt. I felt like I was going to vomit. My palms were sweating profusely, and I was starting to have trouble controlling my breathing. I was so thankful that it was still dark. I know that the agony was easily distinguishable on my face, and I didn't want them to see how much I was struggling. I wondered if it was this difficult for my brother when his day came. I wanted my father to hurry up and open the boxes so I could see what was in them. I wanted to know and for all of the dread to be over. But my feelings reversed themselves when he knelt down to open the first one. I wanted just one more moment to prepare. I almost asked him to wait, but in a short couple of seconds, all the boxes were opened. Up until a few seconds before that, I had tried to talk myself into believing that all of that worry had been for nothing. I told myself that the trip was just going to be a fun outing and I would laugh at myself when it was over. But the boxes had been opened. I saw what was in them. And I knew that I was right to worry. My cousins hadn't lied to me. How I wished they had been. My spirit sank so deeply that I almost fell to my knees. 
I knew it was really going to happen, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I felt two warm, salty tears run down my cheeks. I wiped them away before anyone saw. At least I thought I did. I didn't know how I was going to get the strength to go through with it. The only way I had made it as far as I did was by telling myself that it wasn't really going to happen. My cousins were lying. All the fear and dread had just been brought on by figments of my imagination. But I knew that none of that was true. It wasn't just my imagination. I saw what was in those boxes. My father picked up a sharp instrument from one of the boxes. Then he stood up. He didn't say anything. He just looked at me. My heart pounded and I wanted to cry again. Nothing made him angrier than to see me cry. I knew what he would say if I did. He'd tell me to stop crying or he'd give me something to cry about. And I knew he would do it, too. A lot of the whippings I had gotten from him were for crying, so I knew to never do that in front of him. With that, I held back my tears and tried to look like I didn't care about what was going to happen. I was paying so much attention to my father and the boxes that I lost track of my brother and cousin. My brother spoke from behind me as my cousin stood at his side. He had the poor creature in his clutches. It was all happening too fast. I thought I was going to have more time to prepare. My father placed the sharp instrument in my hand and my brother placed the poor creature before me. It was such a strange feeling. Nobody told me what I had to do. It was as if I knew instinctively what had to be done. I lifted my hand but it was shaking so much I almost dropped the instrument. I lowered it again to fix my grip. My father saw the pleading look on my face. I didn't want to have to go through it. I had hoped that he would return a look of understanding, but all I could see in his eyes was welling anger. I closed my eyes and lifted my hand again. When I opened my eyes, I found myself looking into the eyes of the poor creature. I felt like I could see his fear did he know this was the last day of his life? Was he anticipating the horrific pain that he was about to experience? What kind of justice does this world deal out? What did this poor creature do to deserve this? And how could it be that my own father would force me to do this? For my entire life, he had been my moral compass. He'd been my teacher of right and wrong. And he was the one to force me to do this? Slowly, I moved the sharp instrument to the poor creature's throat. I hoped that if I moved slowly enough that they'd have time to stop me and tell me that it was all a joke. They'd tell me that they just wanted to see if I'd go through with it. But surely they didn't expect me to really kill this poor creature. As slow as I was, no one tried to stop me. I was holding the instrument at the base of his throat. The creature felt the sharp metal on his skin and swallowed. My heart sank with compassion for him. I wanted so much to show him mercy. I paused again. My father started to lose his patience with me. I could see that he was really getting angry. I pressed in on the metal and a drop of blood ran down it. Pushing in was so much more difficult than I thought it would be. Not only did I have to press through the creature's flesh, but I also had to push through my own will and convictions. I knew they could see the agony and strain in my face. I saw anger in my father's face. My cousin's face showed something that looked more like contempt. I knew he thought less of me that day than he did the day before. My brother's face was clear. There was so much disappointment. My father lost all patience and cursed at me. In a knee-jerk reaction, I jabbed the instrument in. In one fluid motion, the instrument penetrated the creature's throat and dislocated its jaw. Its eyes closed tight. I tried to imagine how much pain I had just inflicted on that poor soul that had never harmed me. But I knew that what it was going through was beyond what I could fathom. Before my father could say anything else, my brother stepped in to help. Unmoved by the creature's suffering, he lifted the poor animal into the air by the metal that I jabbed into its throat and lowered him into the water. My father, brother, and cousin each performed the strange ritual that they had just tasked me with. I looked at them in bewilderment, amazed that 
these that I loved so much could be capable of inflicting so much pain and agony with no remorse whatsoever. For the rest of the day, I listened to their idle talk about the fish stories they planned to tell when we got back. From time to time, one of them would reel in his line, check his bait, and cast it out again. Occasionally, one would reel in his line to find a dead minnow. Then he would reenact the horrible ritual. I tried not to look. The Hat Man by Ashley Johnson I believe I saw the hat man. I was asleep and for some reason woke up and he was standing in front of me. I couldn't move at all, but I noticed somebody standing in front of our door. We have a hall nightlight outside our room, so it's not pitch black. My husband keeps his vitamins on his dresser where the door is, so when I first noticed the figure, I thought it was him as he wakes up before me. I started to wake up more, I still couldn't move, and felt my husband and baby still asleep next to me. Fear started to take over more, and I convinced myself someone had broken in. I still couldn't move. The dark figure just stood there, staring at me. It was tall and definitely a man. I couldn't make out any details, but I do know he was wearing a hat and trench coat or a long coat. He was very dark. I couldn't see a face or anything, but I could just feel him staring. I tried to think what I should do or even could do as I felt paralyzed. I came to more and knew it wasn't a human man, it was something else. Side note, somehow I've always been able to talk myself down or out of scary dreams. Sometimes I've even been able to talk myself in a scary dream and almost pause it and decide if I want to keep going or wake myself up. Once I realized it wasn't somebody who'd broken in, I told myself, it's not real, he's not here. I had to force myself to close my eyes, and it was so hard. I just laid there, staring. I finally was able to close my eyes and reopen them to see if he was still there. He was, but he'd moved closer to the bottom side of our bed, but on my husband's side. We have a king, so he still felt a little far away, but nonetheless, I was still very scared. I kept telling myself it was okay, it's not real, that I was just experiencing sleep paralysis. I still couldn't move. Finally, after what seemed like forever, I was able to close my eyes again and sit up. He was gone. I told my husband about it the next day as we have talked about sleep paralysis before, and he has seen the old hag figure and has had that experience. He nodded and knew exactly what I was talking about. Now, it hasn't happened since, and that was a few months, maybe six or seven months ago. I still remember it very clearly, and apparently other people have experienced him. Spooky Stuff from England by Erica the real reason I'm writing is to share with you a couple of odd experiences I've had over the years. I shall start with the entity that lives in our house. It's not an old house by UK standards, probably about 40 years old. We think that whatever entity is here is attached to either one of us or an older object we've brought in. We're fortunate in that our spirit doesn't seem to be in any way malicious, merely mischievous. It all began nine years ago when I was in my late teens. My parents and I would often squabble about missing objects. My parents would seemingly mislay their stuff, and as the teenager, I'd be accused of moving it, borrowing it, or hiding it. Needless to say, this did not amuse me in the slightest, and many a row started with the words, I haven't touched your bloody stuff. You could probably hear the BBC British accent already. Well, this had been going on for a few months, until a weekend when I was just staying at a friend's house a couple of villages over. I woke up on Sunday morning to find a text from my dad. We owe you an apology, it said. I'm curious, though slightly suspicious. Have they accidentally broken something of mine? I reply asking why, and my dad calls me. All this time, we thought it was you moving things, and now something has happened that we can't blame you for. 
Essentially, the night before, my mother had misplaced her address book. It was a pocket-sized book, navy blue with the word addresses embellished on it in silver font. Generally, it was to be found in one of three places, in a desk drawer, on the table next to her armchair, or in her handbag. On this particular day, the address book was nowhere to be found. She and my dad turned the house upside down looking for this tiny book, cursing my name all the while in frustration, assuming I'd hidden it for reasons best known to myself. They went to bed deciding to get me to look for it upon my return the next day. Roll forward to Sunday morning. My dad dutifully got up to make breakfast and bring it up to my mom on a tray, as he does every morning, she is a very lucky lady, and had walked downstairs to the kitchen. He was downstairs for about ten minutes, pottering about making breakfast. He finishes preparing it, loads up the tray, and carries it back towards the stairs to take to my mom. At the bottom of the stairs, he froze. There, on the third step from the bottom, face up, as though it had been placed there with a great deal of intention, was the address book. He is adamant that the address book had not been there ten minutes before, or he would have stepped on it as he descended the staircase. Our house is fairly small, to the point where you can hear clearly if anyone is moving about on a different level. My mom hadn't moved, nor had she heard anyone else moving about. To this day, we don't know what the entity is, or even if there is only the one, but something often gives off a distinctive smell of rolled-up tobacco, no one in our house is a smoker, that only women seem to be able to smell, or very rarely the smell of violet perfume which is accompanied by a cold spot in the living room. Neither of these smells make us feel uneasy. The tobacco smell seems to appear mostly if a woman is alone in the house, or if there's a visitor who is new to the house. It's like whatever it is likes to keep an eye on things to ensure that we are safe. It was unnerving at first, but it's something we've just gotten used to over time. I withheld this information from my partner when I first met him for fear that he would think I was a bit mad. However, when he visited our house, I noticed that he'd often go and look out into the hallway by the stairs. I asked what he was doing, and he told me he kept seeing what looked like an outline of a person lurking in the hallway. I told him not to worry and explained the story. It took a little while, but eventually the entity must have taken to him because he stopped seeing it. A further twist to this story comes about three months after what my partner said about the shadows. I went to catch up to a friend I hadn't seen for ages. We were reminiscing about our childhood and going to each other's houses after school. Out of the blue, she suddenly said, You know, I never liked your hallway by the stairs. It always felt like something was watching me there. At this time, she hadn't met my partner, so there was no way they could have collaborated on this. The second story I'm writing to share is something that happened to me that I cannot scientifically explain, though I dare say there would be others with theories. I, like many other people, have godparents who took an oath at my christening in the traditional way. A few years ago, we sadly lost my godfather, a wonderful man who I didn't see anywhere near as much as I would have liked while he was alive. Our story begins about three years after he died. It was early summer, with evenings that didn't seem to get dark until it was time to sleep. I was driving home from somewhere, in no real rush, singing along to my car stereo. I'd just taken a fairly tight bend at about 25 miles per hour and I wasn't in any real rush to speed up a lot. There was nothing behind me and the road ahead was coming up to another bend within another couple hundred yards or so. I probably increased my speed to about 45 miles per hour, at which my car would have no trouble in making the bend safely. Out of nowhere, in my mind's eye, I saw my godfather. He looked to me exactly as he had the last time I saw him, wearing a checkered suit, glasses, and a placid smile on his face. In my mind's eye, he reached out and put his hand on my shoulder. I had the overwhelming urge to slow my car down. I took my foot off the gas and slowed to about 30 or 35 miles per hour, and as I did, I watched in horror as a flatbed truck came hurtling around the bend I was approaching on the wrong side of the road. Had I continued even at 40 miles per hour, I would have hit the truck head-on. 
I went home feeling very grateful for what can only be described as my guardian angel. Fast forward to six months later. I took my partner to meet my godmother for the first time. She lives a fair way away, so I unfortunately don't see her often. We had lunch, and she tells me she has a gift for me. Your godfather gave this to me before he died, but I've never really worn it. As I have more than one granddaughter, I can't pick one of them to give it to, so this is a gift from myself and your godfather. I opened the package to find a silver St. Christopher's pendant. For anybody who isn't aware, St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. I never told my godmother what happened, mostly to avoid upsetting her or her thinking I was crazy. But I don't think there's any gift she could have given me that would have been more fitting. I wear the pendant every day and take a great deal of reassurance from it. I have several more stories written by Weirdo family members coming up. Want to receive the commercial-free version of Weird Darkness every day? For just $5 per month, you can become an official Weirdo by becoming a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. As a patron, you get commercial-free episodes of Weird Darkness every day, bonus audio, chapters of audiobooks I'm narrating as I narrate them, weeks before the publisher or the author gets to hear them, exclusive news about the podcast, and more. Get on the inside as an official weirdo and never hear another commercial. Click on Become a Patron at WeirdDarkness.com. Holy shit, that was a Bigfoot by Craig Cunning. Hi, Darren. I really enjoy your podcasts. I'm laid up right now and the great stories really help me through the days. I also really appreciate your support of those with depression. I've battled it alone for the better part of my life now and finally, at 60, have a doctor that's helping me through it. I have a Sasquatch encounter that happened years ago. It wasn't an aggressive creature, so although it terrified us, it ended without incident. I first became aware of Sasquatch after watching Legend of Boggy Creek at the theater when it came out in the 70s. After that, it didn't pop into my mind much at all. I kind of filed it away as just a scary creature in a movie. This encounter happened about 15 or 16 years ago. I've always been an avid outdoor guy, not a hunter, just loved the bush. I spent any possible free time in the forest. I lived on Vancouver Island and loved it for back then. Not only did we live on the edge of the wilderness, but in less than an hour we could be far away from civilization. I'd been divorced a couple of years, and on the weekends I had my kids. We were off into the bush exploring. On this particular weekend, it was just my son and I. He was about 10 or 11. I came home from work on Friday night, and as per usual, he had our little pathfinder packed and ready to go. Our usual plans were to head north on the highway until we found a forest road we hadn't been on, and off we'd go. On this Friday night, we managed to get a little north of Campbell River before cutting into the island's interior. Friday night, we found a cool place to camp beside a nice little stream. It was a beautiful night. The next morning, we were off for a day of exploring. No particular destination, just heading down the island, exploring rows and pathways we hadn't gone on before. By evening, we found ourselves down by Lake Cowichan. We found a small path that we could just squeeze the little pathfinder through and were surprised to find a quiet little clearing by the lake. We set up camp, had some hot dogs, and decided to go for a bit of wandering before crashing. I'm not sure what time it was, but the sun was setting. We decided to head back up the trail we came in on, a couple hundred feet or so, to a break in the bush where my son was sure there was another trail. I was a little on edge since we set up camp. Let's just say my spider senses were tingling. I put it off to possibly a bear or a cougar in the area and grabbed my knife and bear spray. I should point out that up until the last couple of years, I had never owned a gun or even fired one. We wandered back up the trail with my son talking 100 miles per hour like he always did on these little adventures. We came to the little off trail and headed up it. 
After about 50 feet, the dense brush opened up to a stand of fir trees that headed back down to the lake. All the trees were very mature, with very few lower branches obstructing our view of the lake. I was wandering in behind my son, enjoying the view of the water, when I almost tripped over my son. He'd stopped in his tracks and was frozen quiet. I looked down at him and he was staring off towards the lake. He then whispered, "'What is that?' I followed his gaze down by the water, and there was a silhouette of something about four foot wide with a head with its back to us. Because of the twilight and being in the forest, I couldn't make out exactly what it was. I will tell you, though, my blood ran cold. Through all of my years of exploring the forest, I've never come across anything that sent this feeling through me. It went through my entire body, and I began to tremble. I don't know why I said what I did, but I whispered to my son, that's just a stump, let's get back to camp. He responded, that's no stump. The thing then began to stand up. We were frozen in place. We thought it was huge before, but when it stood up, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. This thing was easily nine feet tall and as wide as a sheet of plywood. It was clearly hair covered, had a barrel chest and long arms. It turned to look at us, its whole upper body turned as if it had a stiff neck. It looked at us for a few seconds, blew some air from between its lips making a sort of snorting sound. It then turned to its right and walked almost casually off into the denser forest, never looking back. My son and I stood speechless for several minutes when he finally said, Holy shit! First time I ever heard him swear. That was a Bigfoot! After regaining our composure, we headed back to camp. I suggested we pack and leave, but my son would have nothing to do with that, so we made concession and made our bed in the back of the Pathfinder, my logic being that it clearly knew we were there but had done nothing aggressive. At the time, I'd never heard of any encounters, good or bad. We didn't see it again and headed back to town, Langford, the next morning. I mentioned it to a couple of neighbors when we got back and got laughed at and ridiculed for being a drunk. I rarely drink. I was very angry and my son was quite embarrassed. It was then that my son and I agreed to never talk about the encounter with anyone. We didn't want to face the ridicule. After the encounter, I started doing research whenever I could to get a better understanding of what we saw and believe we had two more encounters during our forest exploration time, one of pine cones being thrown at us and another with a creature rummaging through our campsite one night. It's never changed our explorations into the forest. In fact, we now live in the backcountry of northern British Columbia. People here are much more accepting of Sasquatch and just consider it a nuisance in the woods. My son found a bone pile not far from our house last fall, so I'm hoping to get well enough to explore that area with him. I'll let you know what we find. Haunting of a VHS by Ilsa Beauchamp What I'm about to share is 100% true. I know it's true because I wasn't alone when this happened. When I was around 14 years old, one of my older sisters, my younger sister and I, were all watching a scary movie about an abandoned hospital that was built high on top of a hillside that an old roller coaster tycoon rented out for his wife's birthday party. Anyone who's into horror movies probably knows the one I'm talking about. This was back when VHS was still how we watched movies at home. I know, I'm old. Well, after the movie was over, we all just started having a conversation as we normally would, and we were just letting the movie play through the credits. After the credits were through, the tape went to a black screen but was still running. None of us noticed until my older sister stopped mid-sentence and said, "'What's that?' What's what? Myself and my little sister both replied. I can hear something on the video. We all went silent and listened very carefully. After a few seconds, we all heard what sounded like a nurse speaking to a doctor about prepping a patient. We all froze and moved together as a mass towards the TV to be sure that it was coming from there and that we weren't just hearing things. Sure enough, the voices were coming from the TV, but now it was 
both the doctor and the nurse speaking to each other about the subject and experiments and things in technical terms that I can't remember. Needless to say, all three of us were thoroughly freaked out. After the tape came to a complete stop, we thought that maybe it was like a post-credit thing that the producers put in, so we rewound it to try and listen again to see if we could make out exactly what they were saying. But when we played it back, there was nothing but white noise. We've asked other people who watched the movie if they ever experienced the same thing, but we've not found anybody else who has. To this day, none of us have any definitive answer as to what we heard, but we all believe it was something supernatural. The Arizona Shadow Witch by Eric Symbolic I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, the youngest of four children. When I was about five years old, we moved into the house that I would spend most of my childhood. It was a new neighborhood at the time, in the early 80s, on the northwest side of town. The house was a simple three-bedroom ranch-style house. It looked pretty much like all the other houses on the block. I was pretty fortunate that there were a few kids my age to play with. I became good friends with the kid next door. Wesley was his name. He was a year younger, but he loved G.I. Joe as much as I did. We played G.I. Joe all the time, and when we weren't playing G.I. Joe, we were exploring the desert behind the neighborhood. I'd say that we were very lucky that we never ran into rattlesnakes or scorpions, but one thing we found often were satanic symbols along the wash wall and the pentagrams with ashes from whatever was burned and the occasional cat that was used as a sacrifice. Who would have guessed that they would be a sign of things to come? I had a fair understanding of what these symbols represented, for the most part. I have two brothers that were very involved with a fundamental church at that time and would often talk about the works of the devil and saw demons behind every rock and bush. Little did I know that one day one of these demons would crawl from under one of these rocks to terrorize me. In the time I lived in that house, I would come to be terrorized by what may have been a shadow person or quite possibly the hat man. I never had an experience until one fateful day in the summer between second and third grade. I was over at Wesley's playing G.I. Joe as usual when his mom asked me to come over to her room. I approached the entrance of the room, not thinking anything of it. I noticed the mother, the father, and a couple other people I did not recognize standing around the room. They asked if I wanted to see something really cool. I said, sure. One of the men that I did not recognize started to say something. I didn't know what it was he was saying, but suddenly something shot out from under the bed or perhaps between the mattresses and the box spring. It came to the center top of the bed completely underneath the covers. There was a large lump, but quickly the blanket formed around this thing and took the form of a Native American warrior, complete with headdress and tomahawk from the waist up. It was not perfect detail, but you could make out the form quite well. It scared me, but at the same time, it was really cool. The process repeated three more times. A cowboy followed next, shooting his pistols in the air, and then a knight on his horse. I could hear the hoofs galloping till it appeared, and then the horse neighed and disappeared. Finally, the last entity was the most terrifying for me. It was a witch, with a hat and all. She cackled and turned toward me. She said something, but By then, the adrenaline was flowing and my heart was pounding loud into my ears. I couldn't hear the words. All the adults started to laugh. I freaked out and then everything went black after that. The next thing I remember was walking home, crying hysterically. I didn't say anything to my parents. I was too terrified to tell them. I didn't tell my brothers or my sister. None of them were living at home and wouldn't have believed me anyway. I tried to let the incident go and not dwell on it, except one ramification from this seance, for lack of a better term, was my friend was no longer allowed to play with me anymore. I couldn't understand why and what I did. I wasn't the one who conjured the four boogeymen from under the bed. Even his cousin, who was in my class, and a friend that would come over to play with him, weren't allowed to talk to me. I wasn't sure what I did. Wesley's father built a treehouse in their backyard. It was really just a glorified hunting blind on stilts, since the trees in southern Arizona have two-inch-long thorns. 
I remember seeing his mother and him playing in the treehouse, wishing I could play too. I ran into Wesley at school and he finally spoke with me. I asked him why we couldn't be friends. He said that his parents said he couldn't and just left it at that. I asked if he liked his treehouse. I can't play in it anymore, he said. Why not, I asked. Because the witch got out and lives there now. I thought I saw you playing with your mom, I said. No, it was me, but not my mom. It confirmed that what I had experienced was true after all and now the witch was out. I never really saw Wesley again. He and his family moved out and away shortly after that. No one lived in that house for more than two years at a time after that. Unfortunately for me, after they moved, I started getting a late-night visitor. I couldn't tell you what the date was or what time at night, but what I can tell you is one night I woke up to see a dark, humanoid figure standing over me. It appeared to wear a cloak and a hood, perhaps a hat. It wasn't black, but more like a void with shape. Its shoulders were moving up and down like someone breathing heavy. I couldn't tell if it was male or female. Maybe it was the witch. It was making a sound. It was like breathing, but wheezing and growling mixed together. I wasn't sure what to think. I was scared, and I did what any scared shitless kid would do. I threw the covers over my head. I could see it through the blanket. It was still there. I thought maybe I could run to Mom and Dad's room, but the creature seemed to think otherwise, or at least that's the impression I got. I did the only thing I could think of. I started to sing. I sang all the songs from Sunday school I could remember. Jesus loves me, this I know. Deep and wide the B-I-B-L-E, and a few others. I don't know how long it took, but the shadow finally went away. This happened off and on for years. There was no rhyme or reason to its pattern. It would just show up multiple nights in a row and then nothing for weeks or months. Every time it showed, I did the same thing over and over. I sang. It was years before I could talk to anybody about it. One day, I was talking to my friend Pat that lived across the street, and somehow the subject came up. I didn't reveal what happened in the house next door, but I did talk about the shadow person. He told me about an old man with three fingers that would scratch at his window, asking to come in. Later, I found out that Hector down the street would see a lady in his room at night. It seems that I was not the only one. As time went on, I'd heard several stories around my neighborhood and nearby neighborhoods. Perhaps it's the whole area that's a hotbed of spiritual activity. Later, I'd find out that supposedly Arizona has spiritual vortexes, and maybe we were in the middle of one. Unfortunately, the neighborhood started to go downhill. After a neighbor up the street was murdered, my folks decided it was time to move. When we moved, my shadow witch did not follow. It wasn't the end of my encounters with the paranormal, but at least I got a break for a while. My Granddad Billy Whalen by Sinead Kennedy Hi Darren, my name is Sinead and I'm from Dublin, Ireland. I love your channel. I'm a big fan a while now. I've long since contemplated sending you in this story as my grammar isn't the best as I speak Dublin English, but here goes. My Granddad Billy, Granddad Whalen, as I called him, lived with my grandmother a couple doors down from me for all my childhood. They practically raised me since birth as my mom and dad worked very hard. My dad, leading seaman L.S. Kennedy, was always at sea, and my mom worked as a Montessori teacher. My granddad was my mentor, my teacher, my life guru, if you will. I was so close to him, and I miss him dearly. Every day, he'd sit me down and take out the map of the world and educate me on all the cultures and countries. He told me all about World War II. He basically taught me everything I know. I owe a lot to him. For somebody who was born in 1922 and whose grandparents were the Irish famine, he wasn't very religious like our elders here in Ireland of that generation. He was very open-minded. Ever since I was a child, he'd tell me stories about ghosts and banshees and about his many experiences in his life. We talked about space and other worlds and times and dimensions. 
He was the most fascinating person I've ever had the pleasure to have in my life. My grandparents were always old, so I dreaded the day they would pass away. My granddad eventually went to a care home to live out the rest of his days as dementia was setting in and he was getting a bit hard to handle. He had moments where he was okay and it was like he was fine again. Then he would forget me. Me and my husband went to see him in the care home one last Christmas and I was giving him a glass of water and he wouldn't drink it. He said to me, Sinead, I'm tired now. I've lived a great life. I'm sick of this space suit I'm in. I just want to check out now. Understandably, I was crying and I said, stop, would you? He told me not to be sad, that when the time comes of his passing, he'd give me a sign that there is an afterlife, and I promise you this, he said. I just nodded. My granddad passed away three weeks later, peacefully. I was devastated. My rock, my teacher, my best friend was gone. We take our loved ones home when they pass and lay them out, usually in the family home, for friends and loved ones to come pay respects and pot loads of tea offered. It was a long day that day, so I left the family home to go home to bed. At this stage, I'm 26 years old, and I have a family of my own. While I was in bed, I remembered my granddad telling me he'd give me a sign, so I said a little prayer for him, and I dozed off. I awoke with a shake, like how somebody would shake you to wake you up. I initially thought it was my husband, but then I realized he was working night shift. I turned around on the bed, and to my bewilderment, my bedroom was glowing green. I looked around, and I had a sense that somebody was in the room with me. It wasn't a scary feeling, but a peaceful feeling. And then suddenly again, a nudge on my arm. This time it was harder. My granddad always did this. Even when he'd be talking to me, he'd nudge me as to get my full attention. I knew it was him. Then, all of a sudden, the radiator started shaking all over the house. I was creeped out then. I froze in my bed. I shouted out clearly, I know it's you, Granddad. Thanks for your sign, but you're scaring me now. Please stop. I love you. And all of a sudden, it stopped. The green faded. The radiators stopped banging, and I knew he was gone. The funeral was two days later, and I was back in the family home. All my cousins were taking pictures of Granddad in the coffin, so I thought maybe I should, too. I had a Canon camera at the time, so I took three pics of him laid out with his Granddad hat and his cane by his side. Pics looked good on the screen, and I was to upload them to my laptop as soon as all of this was over. When I returned home and uploaded the pictures, every picture I took in my Granddad's house of the family and friends came out perfect, but the three pictures I took of my Granddad in the coffin were blurry. I couldn't make out any of it, and I couldn't get my head around it. Then I got it. Granddad didn't want me to remember him stuck in the body of a frail, sick old man, or the old spacesuit, as he called it. He wanted to be remembered as Billy Whalen, my life coach. Up next, we'll step into the Chamber of Comments. We had a blast doing it last time, so we're doing it again. I'm telling you about it a lot because I really want you to join me. Put it on the calendar. It's Sunday night, January 19th, 11 p.m. Central Time. Uh, If you're on the East Coast of the U.S., that would be Monday, January 20th at midnight. We're having another weirdo watch party, and we're going to be joining Don from Don's Breakfast Cereal as he presents old black and white cereals from TV and movies of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. We'll be watching the old serial The Spider's Web this time around. Last time we were in the uh, in the Weirdo Watch Party at EerieLateNight.com, we had a blast in the chat room. We are, we're in the chat room as we watch the, the movies and uh, the, the serials and stuff, and we make snide comments about what we're watching, and uh, the, the, the horror hosts that are with us, they are, they're always in there as well, making snide comments too. Uh, so I'll be in the chat room, and I'm inviting you, my weirdo family, to join me. Of course, you can go there anytime. They're always playing movies there on the website at EerieLateNight.com, but the weirdo watch party that uh, I'm going to be for, that I'm going to be in there for again, is Sunday night, January 19th, 11 p.m. Central Time. That would be Monday the 20th at midnight for those of you on the Eastern Time Zone. 
Uh, I think it'd just be a, so much fun if all of all of the Weirdo family got together and jumped into the chat room at once. We're all watching the movie at the same time, commenting on it. It's just going to be a lot of fun. We've done it a couple of times already, and it, it'll it just get bigger and better as we do it. So I'd love to see you there with the rest of the Weirdo family at EerieLateNight.com. Again, Sunday night, January 19th, 11 p.m. Central Time. That would be Monday, the 20th of January, midnight Eastern Time. Hope you can join me. We'll step inside the Chamber of Comments in just a moment, but if you made it this far, well, you can count yourself as part of our weirdo family. And if you like the episode, please share it with your friends and family through your social media, email, text, and invite them to give it a listen too. And this entire episode was all stories from our weirdo family members, people who listen to the podcast. And if you have a dark tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. Also on the website, you can find the Weirdos Facebook group, paranormal and horror audiobooks that I've narrated, the Weird Darkness store, my social media places. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. And if you listen to the podcast at your place of employment, be sure to check out the Weird at Work page. Every month, I will randomly choose one business to give a shout-out to, and I'll also send out some Weird Darkness coffee mugs. In fact, we're in the process of making some specific Weird at Work coffee mugs. Those are in the process of being created right now. I can't wait to show the ideas to you. Uh, The artist Paul Spangler and I have been going back and forth with some of the ideas and some of the funny things we could do with monsters and stuff in the office office environment. It's a lot of fun just to talk about. I can't wait to see what he comes up with. So uh, be looking for those. But in the meantime, make sure sure, uh, if you do listen at uh, at your workplace, go to the Weird at Work page and register so you'll be in the random drawing each month. And now let's step into the Chamber of Comments. Here in the Chamber of Comments, I answer your emails, comments, podcast reviews, tweets, letters I get in the mail, and more. I would love it if you could give me a five-star review if you're listening in a podcast app, and uh, that helps get the word out about the show. Uh, But if you're not listening in a podcast app or if you've already, I I think you can leave more than one review if you want to. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but regardless, I would still love to hear from you personally, even if you don't leave a review. You can send a handwritten letter or a card to me in the mail, which you can get all of my contact and mailing information on the website on the contact page, or just send me an email, which is what most people do. It's so easy to do, and that way I can also reply to you which I try to do with all the emails that I receive, if I possibly can. You can email me, Darren, at WeirdDarkness.com. Lisa G. left some comments on the episode about Indrid Cold, the Grinning Man. Uh, I do have a link to that episode, by the way, in the show notes, if you've not listened to it, if you just want to hear it again. Lisa says, Indrid Cold was not described as a creepy or scary guy. He was described as a pleasant man. The accounts of entities sound like completely different individuals slash super-terrestrials. How can people be so ignorant? I hate fear-based videos. If it's a negative entity, it'll most likely feed off that fear. Who wants to feed a negative entity? If it's a positive one, well then, there's no need to be afraid, is there? I would say just be cautious. You will feel a sense of unease in their presence. It won't feel like normal fear as if you encountered a normal thing but never seen before. We have intuition for a reason. Well, those are some pretty good thoughts there, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I don't really know enough to say either way on on what you're saying, but you do make some interesting points and uh, you bring out some thoughts that people uh, should consider about Indrid Cold. So thank you for the email. Got an email from Susan in Traverse City, Michigan. She said, Hi, Darren. I love your podcast and want to give it a five-star review, but maybe because I'm 67 years old, I just don't get it. I can't figure out how to do it. I don't have iTunes, just the podcast with Apple. If you help me find the path, please let me know. You're a fantastic storyteller, and I have no idea how you find enough material to put out these podcasts. I am myself a writer, and I'm amazed. You are an inspiration. I'm also impressed that you have a passion for depression, which is everywhere. I'm a suicide survivor and will struggle for the rest of my life. 
Your stories take us away from our own nightmares and let us escape with our own minds, even for a little while. I agree that if we can just help one person, it's worth everything. A true fan, signed Susan in Traverse City, Michigan. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate it. You know what? I'm very glad to hear that your suicide attempt was not successful because, well, now you can bring joy into others' lives with your writing, and you can also bring wisdom and guidance to others who suffer from depression and and dark thoughts because, well, you've been there yourself. I mean, you, 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 you're, in fact, you're often there now, as you mentioned in your email. And we all know sometimes all it takes is just knowing somebody understands what we're going through, somebody that's there to talk to. Uh, it's cliche, but, you know, misery loves company. Uh, don't worry about the review, though, Susan. <laughs> that's all right. You know, you just sending me this email like you did, that means a whole lot more to me than the reviews. And, just tell others about the podcast, suggest they give it a try. That is, that's far more effective and uh, more special to me than anything you can do in a review. So thank you very much, though. I appreciate it. God bless you, Susan. Got an email from Andrew Hancock. Uh, he actually goes by, the, by uh, Fox with his friends. Uh, he says, I'm very happy to have found your podcast, Weird Darkness. I listen to it at work in a weary warehouse. I have been looking for a podcast exactly like yours for ages. A man with a great voice who loves his fans and has faith in the Lord. You, sir, make me happy to be called a weirdo. I myself have suffered from depression for many, many years. I'm so happy you're helping spread the word that there is help. Now, as a side note, why don't you come back to Kansas, man? We miss you here. <laughs> from Kansas, by the way, Ottawa. I'd absolutely pay to see you, and I'd bring, uh, bring along some other weirdos as well. Thank you for everything, Mr. Marler. God bless. Sincerely, Andrew Fox Hancock. Well, thank you, uh, Fox. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, my hometown is Olathe, Kansas. That's that's what I consider home. I spent most of my life there before I ended up getting married and moving away. I am slowly adding various Comic-Cons uh, to my schedule, and so it is possible that I might make it back to the Kansas City area someday. Uh, maybe Ottawa someday. You never know. In fact, if you know specifically, and this is not just for you, Fox, but for everybody who's listening, if you know specifically of any Comic-Cons or horror festivals or whatever that uh, are coming to your area that you think maybe I should be at to uh, represent Weird Darkness, like to have a table or a booth there, tell me about it. I, I'm always looking for new opportunities. I can't guarantee I'm going to be at all of them because it gets really expensive with all of that traveling because I don't sell anything at the... At the uh, at the film fests or the comic cons or anything. I know most people who have a table or booth do, but I don't. I'm just there to tell people about the podcast and give away free buttons and stickers and magnets and stuff like that just to spread the word. So it gets really expensive for me to travel, but if I can, I will because I really do enjoy doing it and I think it's important to do. So again, if, if you know of any of those coming to your area that I should know about, drop me an email and tell me about them. Back to you, Fox, though. Uh, glad you found the podcast and that you appreciate what I'm doing. It's great to know that I have another weirdo in Christ listening. And then an email from Matthew Hopkins. He said, Hi, Darren. I found Weird Darkness about five months ago. I think it's great. I listen whilst I'm driving my excavator. I suffer with clinical depression, and it gets pretty dark sometimes, but you're helping raise awareness, and you being a fellow sufferer helps me a lot. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, by the way, I am working on a depression awareness campaign idea. If you uh, follow the Weird Darkness page on Facebook or if you're in the group, you already know what I'm talking about. But I'm trying to come up with something for October that I think will be very impactful and really bring depression out into the open. Uh, but I'll tell you more about that as we get more details. In the meantime, I'll answer more of your emails, comments, and more next time. Uh, you can find all my social media on the website. You can find my physical mailing address on the contact page. But the easiest thing to do is uh, just drop me an email, darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N, darren at weirddarkness.com. Hey, I was just talking about the Comic-Cons and stuff. I'm always updating my website's events calendar with new Comic-Cons, horror expos, film fests, and other places that I do plan to have a booth or a table at to promote Weird Darkness. Well, at a lot of those events, I am planning to do the podcast live on Facebook, on location for live stream episodes at these events. 
and I'm in the process of contacting all of the the uh, the uh, the uh, owners or managers of the events to make sure that it's okay for me to do that. And most all of them are saying, "Yeah, what a great idea! We'd love for you to podcast live from here." So. Uh, be sure, if you've not already, be sure to like the Weird Darkness Facebook page at facebook.com slash weirddarkness. That way you will be notified if a live stream does begin. And also, um, I'm keeping up the uh, updates or the uh, the events, that is, updated on the website on the events calendar. So that way you can kind of look ahead to see where I'm going to be and when I'm planning on doing some live streams. Uh, all stories in this episode are purported to be true, and all of them were written by our weirdo family members who listen to the podcast. If you liked this idea of doing a podcast of nothing but weirdo stories, let me know. And thank you to all of you who have submitted your stories. I have a lot more to share in the future. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Marler House Productions 2020. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 52, verse 22a, cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. And a final thought, nobody can make you happy until you're happy with yourself first. I'm Darren Marler. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>